Uh, Brian Jensen is going to talk a little bit on managing European corn borer in the absence of traits. Brian currently works with the UW Extension in the Integrated Pest Management Program at the Department of Entomology. Please welcome Brian Jensen. Thanks, Larry. Uh, when I was given the title of talk, I thought this title worked great. Then I realized there might be a small segment of people in this audience that may not know what ECB stands for. I'm being a little facetious. Uh, certainly, you've heard of it. It's European corn borer. But have you had a chance to scout for it, look for it, manage it? Some people could nod their head. Yeah, the older people in the room can, but you look around the room, there's a lot of very young people. And likely, since the release of the above ground uh, BT traits, uh, that has really knocked corn borer populations back down. And for the most part, I'll bet a lot of the younger people, younger than Dan, uh, have not had to deal with it. So that's the reason why they asked me to talk about uh, European corn borer. Why discuss it? I gave you one reason, but another reason, if you're in here for Chris's talk, um, this has been tied for the lowest um, uh, population of European corn borer in the 74-year history of the DADCAP survey. Okay, so why talk about it? We are getting locally heavy populations, uh, and and why are we getting those? A couple possibilities. I don't think it's resistance. And in, in fact, I'm I'm relatively sure it's not a resistance problem. But I think in part we're those areas will have a lot of non-GMO host crops planted in the area. So that will help support the populations a little bit. And also there may be some other native non-crop host plants planted as well. But also, I think one of the other driving factors might be that we're seeing more conventional corn being planted, and that too will help support corn borer populations. But again, there's no reason for me to think that these locally high populations are a result of uh, resistance. The topics I'll cover, identification, life cycle, damage symptoms, scouting, economic threshold, and management for European corn borer. Little introduction, European corn borer, Astrinia nubilalis, for what it's worth, that's a Latin name. They're in the family Pyralidae, which is kind of unusual for our field crop insect pests. Most of our let pests are noctuids. It's an introduced pest, I think Krista had mentioned that. Uh, roughly early 1900s when it was first introduced, probably came from Italy, uh, Hungary, on broom corn. Uh, and broom corn is just what it is. It was uh, a type of corn plant that was imported to make brooms. Uh, official detections, uh, Boston was uh, 1917. Around the Lake Erie area, they found it by 1921. And then uh, 17 years later, 1938, it was found in Wisconsin. That's a relatively short period of time when you think about the type, type of economy we had back in the, uh, at the turn of the last century. And then it moved on to Nebraska by 1944. Right now, European corn borer is found throughout the continental United States and Canada. Uh, the adults. Typically, we don't talk about it, identification of adult moth pests, but for European corn borer, I think it takes, we should take a little bit of time to recognize what the adults are because we can scout for the adults. And when the adults are active and, and present, that can give us the information that we need to uh, determine when to start scouting for European corn borer. Uh, the males and females look different. The female is on the left. Uh, they both have the same patterns on the four wings. It's just that the, the male has more distinctive or more contrast in those, uh, those patterns. Um, and the male, the admin tends to extend past uh, the the forewing. The eggs, we've got to uh, learn how to scout for them. During second generation, that is what we look for. When they're first laid, they're a very creamy white color and they're laid uh, one on top of the other, a lot like fish scales. On the picture on the left, that's what we call the blackhead stage. 
and that black head is the black head of the developing larvae. When you start to pick up that black head stage, those eggs will usually hatch within a 24 hour period of time. The larvae, we also scout for them as well as their damage. When they first hatch, they're maybe one or two millimeter in length, they will have that jet black head. The more mature larvae that you see on the right hand side, they tend to take on, not always, but they tend to take on a little bit more coloration in their body, maybe a more of a smoky gray color or a, a tannish color. And you can pick up some dots on the back, but no real good uh, way to identify them. Um, but based on time of the year, crop they're in, and that sort of thing, and they will have that jet black head. The host range for a corn borer is pretty wide. A uh, lot of uh, native plants that they can survive on, but in terms of crop plants, uh, field sweet popcorn are good hosts. Potatoes, certain varieties of potatoes are very attractive to the adults to come in and lay eggs. Snap beans and other succulent beans like uh, kidneys and lima beans uh, can be fed on peppers and also on hops. And that's just a sampling of the crop plants that corn borers can use as hosts. Life cycle, there are five larval instars per generation. The first generation peak moth flight will be at roughly about uh, 600 degree days. The second generation moth flight is between uh, 1,550 degree days and uh, 2,100. And the take home message there, I think, for that is that's about a three week flight period. That's, you know, when you, when you get an insect with multiple generations, that usually that first generation is pretty short and succinct. With each uh, generation after that, it tends to get a little bit more drawn out, and that certainly is the case with European corn borer. So that's about a three week flight period, and that uh, will make managing, economic management of corn borer in uh, corn a bit more difficult because it will be very hard to make one well timed application to control corn borer. There can be, in some summers, a partial third generation. But that's a dead end for them. If they do not make it, and most of the time that partial third generation will not, if they don't make it to the fifth end star, they will die. They cannot overwinter. They overwinter as fifth end stars. That is what you'll find inside the corn stalk right now. And um, they'll pupate probably mid to late May sometime. Okay, uh, we talked about moth identification and why that's important because we can use several monitoring methods of the adults to have better time our field scouting activities. Degree days is one of those. We just talked about degree, de degree days. You have a couple sources of information. One is the Wisconsin Pest Survey Bulletin. Do a, a search for uh, Wisconsin and Pest Bulletin and that will be your, your number one uh, uh, choice at the top of the list. If you don't get it, I will ask why not. Uh, it is an excellent first alert bulletin. Whether you get it for degree days or not, get it, please. Uh, your other source of uh, degree days is the UW Extension Ag Weather website. Uh, that's a URL for it, and I think if you did a search for UW Extension Ag Weather, that too will be the top choice. Uh, that will also give you degree days in near real time. Uh, at best, it will be one day old, but you can also get degree days for sea corn maggot, um, uh, stock borer, hot vine borer, and um, alfalfa weevil. DATCAP will also uh, publish their uh, black light trap results. That can be an excellent way to monitor for adults. That's something you're not going to do yourself. Uh, black light traps are expensive. They're difficult to go through. They're not a, fun, a lot of fun. I don't like doing it. Uh, but you can get that, that information from the pest survey bulletin. And again, that's going to help you time your field scouting activities. If you look in some of the catalogs, you will see that pheromone traps are available for European corn borer. I, I caution against using them. In general, pheromone traps are really good because they attract one species. Um, but there are some problems with corn borer, and that main problem is that there are two strains present uh, in Wisconsin. 
There's the eastern strain, which a bit, is a bit more common in the eastern part of the United States that tends to uh, uh, feed on non-corn uh, hosts, but it will also feed on corn. Uh, and there's also the Z strain, which is a, the predominant strain in the Midwest. It does have a greater attraction to corn. But we have both strains in Wisconsin, and uh, I'm not sure. If, if you do plan on doing that, you'll need to use a uh, couple pheromone traps, one with the E strain and one with the, the Z strain. The other thing that you can easily use when monitoring for uh, adults is go to their action sites. These are usually found around field edges, grass waterways, ditch banks, uh, terraces, things like that. Uh, the grass species that they tend to like the best are the bromes, giant foxtail, and there's other grasses. Grasses that tend to collect a lot of dew in the morning because that free water is really important to the adults. If they get stressed from lack of water, they tend to lay fewer eggs. And their aggregation sites, that's, those are areas where the adults tend to aggregate in part to get the free water and because they're aggregating, that's where they tend to do adult-like things like mating and then moving into the field to lay eggs. So again, uh, to leave you with that, uh, the last, the final bullet on there, it, by walking those action sites, uh, that will again help you time when uh, your field scouting activities should be starting. Okay, let's talk a little bit about first generation damage and I should have uh, put that in quotes. First generation damage is not, the damage you get on the corn is not dependent on the generation but rather on the crop stage. Usually with uh, first generation we're talking about vegetative corn although uh, uh, if we have second generation on very, very late planted uh, field corn or even sweet corn, you can have first generation type damage. The first couple of instars, again, very small, will be more leaf feeding, and that's not considered economic at that point in time. And your symptoms will be shot holing, uh, maybe a window painting, and eventually as the larvae get bigger, you can get transverse holes across the leaf. How does that happen? Uh, when they first hatch, they migrate down into, into the whirl. Again, we're talking about veget vegetative stage corn. And initially, they will start feeding on those rolled up corn leaves. Uh, and I have a picture of the damage in just a little bit. You can see what we mean by shot holing. It looks like you stood back about 30 yards, uh, shot the plant with a shotgun, and there's random holes throughout the, the newly emerging leaves. Again, that's not economic, but it's a sign of things to come. The other type of damage that first generation can do is tunneling into the stalk. And that usually starts about with the third instar when they're about three-eighths of an inch long or the size of a, a dime. And their galleries, their stalk tunneling, tunneling, will usually be at the ear zone or lower. Sometimes that might help you as you're doing a post-mortem, tell if you had problems with first gen or generation or second based on where that tunneling is found in the stalk. It's not foolproof, but it can help. Um, and for each larvae on first generation, they can cause about 5% yield loss. Okay, there's a picture of the shot holing I was talking about. Take a close look, these holes are small. Uh, and they're from the newly emerging leaves. The other thing you can look at is those newest leaves coming out of the world, they have no damage. What does that tell you? They have burrowed into the corn stalk. And uh, part of that message is once they have burrowed into that corn stalk, you cannot control them. You have to control first generation when they're feeding in the world. Second generation damage, and we're going to talk about uh, uh, usually uh, reproductive stage corn. Uh, the leaf or midrib feeding uh, will be just the initial feeding after hatching. That will be a very sh brief period of time. When they start tunneling into the stalk, typically I had mentioned that will be from the ear zone and above as compared to first generation. And the tunnel length from second generation can be quite extensive. Uh, if they're in the meat of the stalk, just above the ear zone, 
you might have a half inch, inch, inch and a half gallery. If they're burrowing into the corn plant up by the tassel, you might have a five inch or longer uh, gallery. And uh, one of your uh, symptoms of second generation damage can be a broken tassel. Uh, stock lodging, and stock lodging is a generic term that we use that covers just about anything that makes the corn plant go over. It does look significantly different from uh, rootworms, from compaction, uh, but not all that different from uh, some of the stock rots. And with corn borer, what we usually look at, uh, it's more of a kinking of the stem, where that stem uh, uh, bends over at a, a 45 degree angle or more. With second generation, we're looking at a physiological yield loss of about 4% per larvae, and then you have the, the harvest loss, and that I cannot put a damage estimate on. Um, that's from feeding on the ear shank. They're hollowing out that ear shank, the ear shank gets weak, and then that ear drops to the ground. And there's also uh, harvest loss uh, just from the fact that the stalks have, uh, have lodged. They break off when you uh, try to combine. Uh, and then finally, I talked about ear shank damage. Uh, they can damage, do some direct damage to the ear by feeding on the kernel. That in field corn is generally minimal. Uh, a few kernels, uh, that sort of thing, uh, usually not considered too economic, unlike it would be with sweet corn or, or popcorn. But it can be a potential entry point for ear rots. Okay, that's uh, second generation uh, um, entry hole for corn borers. You can see a little frass showing up on the outside of the stalk. Uh, a gallery on the left, a smaller one on the left. The one on the right is relatively fresh. You can still see the larvae in there. Uh, but once that larvae is finished up or been killed by predators, uh, you tend to get a, a browning uh, of the stalk. Some of the eardrop, we just talked about that a little bit. That's in addition to that 4% physiological yield loss. And here's a picture from the 1950s, probably. And don't think that anything from the 1950s is considered old. But I wanted to show you this, just give you an idea of what uh, we had to deal with in, in the days gone by. Um, so this was from the probably the mid-1950s. But during the mid-1990s, we were dealing with populations almost as high as what you see in this classic photo. Uh, during that period of time, we had significant lodging by corn borers, and that's about the time that the BT hybrids became, um, it came on, on the market. Okay, uh, scouting for first generation. Our scouting procedures are different for first generation as they would be for second. Um, on first generation scouting, start at about v V6 or later. You don't need to scout much earlier than that because there is a, a uh, uh, feeding deterrent called Dimboa in very young corn that if corn borers hatch and they do start to feed, they'll quit feeding and they'll die. Once you get to the V6 stage of corn or later, that concentration of Dimboa, that's an acronym, for a long name that I can't begin to pronounce. That concentration lowers and corn borers can survive in V6 or later corn. Procedure would be to examine five sets of 20 plants per field, 100 plants total, and look for that shot, shot holing. Uh, determine what percent of the plants are infested. And then, it's also important, in two uh, uh, damaged plants per set, pull out those whorl leaves, unfurl the, the, the uh, corn leaves, and count the larvae. And the reason for that is, remember when we were talking earlier about it, the damage, each larvae will cause about a 5% yield loss. And one more point on that. If we're finding a lot of first, maybe early six, second instar larvae when we're scouting, you might have uh, seven or eight, nine larvae per whorl. Don't count those, come back later there can be very, very high mortality of uh, first, second instar larvae in world stage corn, especially if it's been hot and dry or you get a good hard driving rain. 
The economic threshold for first generation corn borers, kind of a worksheet, worksheet type program. Uh, the first three lines were taking uh, field information, percent of the plants infested, the average number of borers per plant to get an average, uh, to get a field average. Then we take that field average of number of corn borers per plant times the 5% yield loss. And what we're trying to do is look at how much yield loss we're going to have in that one particular field. And then you can read through the rest of the lines if you want to, but then you then you try to put a dollar estimate on that loss, and then you compare it with what your control costs might be. Keeping in mind, if you look at line number five, uh, we do not control 100% of the larvae. We do not control 100% of the insects. Uh, our best guess for percent control with European corn borer, first generation is 80% control. That worksheet is in A3646, the extension publication, pest management in uh, field crops. And you can go to extension's website, uh, search for the learning store, and you'll get a whole host of uh, extension publications. And then uh, you can do, do a search for that. Second generation, uh, typically when things work out just fine, it's uh, the, the timing when they're laying eggs will be usually late, um, late July, early August, first two, three weeks of August. That's usually post uh, initiation of the tassel. We talked about the uh, flight period, 1,550 degree days at space 50 uh, to 2,100 degrees. Examine 10 sets of five consecutive plants and count the number of egg masses on that plant. Egg masses will be laid usually 90% within the year zone by a, a leaf or two. They can be laid on the top of the leaf, on the bottom of the leaf, usually close to the midrib, although not always. If you find them on the top of the leaf, count them. If you find them on the bottom of the leaf, count them. If you find them on the flag leaves of the husks or on the husk itself, count them. If you find it on the uh, stalk, count them. Uh, but I would not spend a lot of time reviewing, looking at the whole stock, you know, that's maybe a one in a thousand type uh, situation where they will lay eggs on the stock. So for the most part, just look at them on the, on the leaves and keep track of the number that you find. And for second generation, we have a similar worksheet. It works out uh, pretty much the same as it did for the first generation. And the value of these is you're not using a single economic threshold that's been developed. Here, you can develop one for yourself, for that field, with that, um, with that yield potential, with that uh, expected selling point, and you can really fine tune what that economic threshold is. As far as rescue treatments, we're probably getting close to running out of time, and more importantly, lunch, but we have several insecticide classes that are available. Uh, probably the top one are the synthetic pyrethroids. In terms of the number of labeled insecticides, the diamides, uh, the chlorantran, nilaprol, flubendiamide are also good uh, insecticides to use. If you're in an organic situation and want to use an organic BT product, uh, timing is going to be really critical. Um, for the BTs to work the best, you got to you have to have really, really small larvae, first or second instars. We do have some organophosphates that are labeled for use on corn. There are still some carbamates, uh, but one or two problems with them, they are either very short residual or they are very toxic. And as a result, there's better choices. A lot of natural control going out there for European corn borer. We have the predators that can feed on both the egg and larvae, things like lady beetles, number of species available, uh, minute pirate bugs, there are parasitoids, and by that I mean it's an insect uh, that's feeding on another insect and it spends the majority of its time uh, feeding on a single host. We have the trichogramma species that can feed on the eggs and a number of parasitic wasp and flies that can feed on the larvae. Uh, when conditions are right, we have several pathogens that can uh, control both the adults 
and uh, the larvae. There's a, a fungal pathogen, Bavaria. Uh, there's Bt uh, that can kill only the, uh, the larvae. And then also there's a microsporidia called Nosema, which, is a, a, um, it, which can affect different species of Nosema, can affect different adults. And it may not kill them, but it will reduce the uh, number of eggs that are laid. And then finally, uh, birds can be quite a, a predator on uh, larvae. And you can walk into a field which has a um, significant number of larvae feeding on the ears, and the, the husks are stripped from birds feeding. They have found that and used it as a, a food source. And then finally, uh, cultural control. And I'll end with this slide. Yes, stock chopping can help control your pink hornbore populations, but it's most useful on a landscape level. If you do it only in your fields, the adults are mig migratory and they can move around uh, from one field uh, to the next. So there might be limited value to stock chopping. But what you can use, even if you were not able to treat for a European corn borer, use that field data to uh, plan your, your harvest schedule. On those fields that have the highest corn borer populations, those would be the first ones that I, I would want to harvest, uh, maybe even a silage corn, if at all possible. Uh, but if grain is your only choice uh, to limit uh, stock uh, lodging or ear dropping, those would be the fields I would harvest first. Any questions? <laughs>